now we're on a marathon. We're always dancing when the music plays. Join us now, we're on a marathon. Dancing, that's why the night's Patriots Day, April 17th, 1995. Over 12,000 runners start the Boston Marathon. 1996 will mark the 100th anniversary of the race. More than 40,000 runners are expected to take off from downtown Hopkinton, which would be about 39,984 more runners than started the very first Boston Marathon. 18 runners took part in that first race, which started on Pleasant Street in Ashland. The marathon would have its starting point in Ashland for the next quarter of a century. In 1899, the start was moved back to the High Street Bridge. And in 1907, Stevens Corner, across from the present day Knights of Columbus, became the third Ashland starting point. The marathon draws its name from the legend of Pheidippides, who in 490 BC ran 24 miles from Marathon to Athens to announce news of a Greek military victory. The first modern marathon took place at the 1896 Olympics in Greece. The next year, the Boston Athletic Association decided to sponsor its own race. For the starting line, they settled on this spot, 25 miles due west of Boston. While poking through the files one day, I ran across the original letter written in 1942 by one of the two people that measured the original race. And only then did I realize it had not originated in Hopkins. And I more or less pursued it after that. But, but that was the main thing. The fellow said that, and almost nobody in either town realized it had started in Ashland. For two years at this spot, then they found out they were measuring, they were inaccurate. It was 24 point something. So they moved it up to the brand new bridge. It was built in 1896, and this was 1899. So they started it at the bridge. This bridge used to be up where the temporary bridge is at the moment. The bridge will be moved down at the original start of the first and second race. It'll be put across the river and will create some kind of little marathon park. The reason they're saving the bridge is because of its unique architecture. It's just coincidental that it's with a marathon. So from 1907 to 1923, Stevens Corner was the starting place of the marathon, as long as it was a 25-mile marathon. One of the runners who took off from Stevens Corner in 1909 was a teenage factory worker from Nashua, New Hampshire, named Henry Raynaud. It was his first marathon. His great-grandson, Brett Meisner, tells of what was, even for those days, a somewhat unusual training regime. It said that he prepared for the marathon uh, by eating uh, solely bread and drinking water for the uh, the last week before the marathon, um, which is something I wouldn't doubt from stories I've heard about my my great grandfather. The first day I ran two miles, but my greatest struggle was getting the time in which to train. I go to work at 6:30 in the morning and get home at six at night. So you see, I had to do my running after supper. A week ago today I ran 10 miles, and last Tuesday night 11 miles. I finished strong each time and was sure I could make the marathon distance. Um, another interesting thing about the race is that uh, he almost lost it to someone who, uh, who was an imposter in the race. Um, in fact, this, this imposter who was uh, looking on at the, at the race from the sidelines uh, jumped in to the race um, minutes before the, the finish line, and, um, but he was later disqualified. I trained on bread and butter with a little meat now and then. A cup of tea with all my meals. I have always lived at home and believed that the good food they gave me there gave me such a good constitution. When they made it 26 miles or 85 yards, then it moved up to Hopkin. The start of the marathon involves not just runners, but the whole community. Every year, for about six hours, Hopkinton becomes a sort of mini Woodstock. As a member of the Hopkinton Marathon Committee, Jack LaDuc is a busy man every Patriot's Day. The morning of the race, <coughs> I kind of uh, hover, if you, for lack of a better term, and try to do, try to help anyone that needs help uh, putting out fires that day. Anything that can be done on foot, because in past years, the streets close at 8.30. You can't be running around in your vehicle too much. 
but if there were any hot spots, uh, someone doesn't show up, you have to make a phone call or go help someone set up tables or just pretty much utility type work. And then around 10, between 10 and 10.30, the buses from Boston with the elite runners, the top 150, and the invited runners for parents' reasons uh, would come through town and we would escort them to where they would stay until the start of the race, which is the church directly adjoining the starting line. Uh, BAA officials pretty much man the doors and state police. Um, there's always a concern that someone's going to get in there and distract a, a potential winner, and to them, this is their payday. The traditional pre-race meal has changed over the years. Bill Rogers started his first marathon in 1973, but did not finish. 20-some years ago, we really weren't as aware of we knew we should drink during a race, but we didn't know how much we should drink and that we should drink much, much more than we realized at the time. And, uh, but the morning of the race, I had pancakes. I think we were told to eat pancakes in those days for carbohydrates. And uh, <clears throat> it was kind of a warm day. And I just remember, I, me I remember going into the high school and they checked your heart, you know, like with a stethoscope or something like that. They'd give you a little physical, you know, and, um, and then making my way down near the start and seeing some runners that I knew from my past collegiate days. But I thought I was going to run a fairly fast time because I had run pretty fast in some shorter distance races. But it was, didn't work out that way. The art of marathon preparation has evolved with each passing year. In 1975, Rogers made a few changes, and he won in record time. My brother, Charlie, and friends would come out on the course, and they'd give me water. That really helped me a lot. Uh, the marathon, many times we didn't have enough water, really, in the old days. And I can remember running the marathon and, and trying to ask people, water, water. But the spectators didn't really, maybe, some of them, sometimes they didn't know, they would be giving you orange slices. But we really needed a lot of water, and that was a sign that I was dehydrated. And so. To cover that, you know, I would ask, you know, my friends would come out and give me a bottle of water, and then I'd run with a bottle of water. I could sip it, and I'd go along and sip it. So, so, so that's how things changed. But then gradually, over periods of time, they did more and more. As the running boom developed, they, re they started to study these, you know, sports medicine. The start used to be up on Hayden Row near the high school, making necessary a 90-degree turn onto Route 135, a turn which many runners considered quite harrowing. It was, because everyone was sprinting like crazy to try to get to the corner. It was kind of crazy that it's a 26-mile race and everyone was sprinting to get to the corner. But there was something about being in position at that corner where you wanted to get away from the pack. You didn't want to be tripped or have one in your way. You wanted to get out and get into a smooth pace that was just right, you know. But it was a little nerve-wracking. It was like you didn't know what was around the corner. <laughs> Runners are a little bit uh, odd that way, I think. <laughs> After the start was moved back to Main Street, Jack LaDuc had an idea. Just in passing, I mentioned to the committee chairman at the time, I'd sure like to dress up the starting line, because up to that point, it was a white stripe across the street. And he asked what I had in mind, and I kind of described it to him, and they, everybody lit up and said, let's try it. So that became my first official function of the marathon, was to paint the starting line. I tried to change the line a little bit every year so it wouldn't look the same, it wouldn't, wouldn't be too predictable. I'd change color schemes and change the lettering font and uh, positions of certain things. Someone told me that it gets measured every year. I don't know if that's true, but if it is true, I know there are fresh orange marks every year right at the curb where the starting line wants to begin. And then all the thickness of the starting line is approximately seven feet. Everything gets painted east of the start so that uh, the idea is the overhead camera gets to see the starting line at the start of the race with all the runners behind it. One of the reasons for changing the original Ashland starting line was to avoid the downtown train crossing. Not that it took that long for the runners to cross the tracks. Even as late as 1923, there were only 67 starters in the field. All this has been all since the running craze. The whole thing has changed completely. Not since the 30s, but since the 50s and 60s. Like a lot of the stuff, too, you must remember now that when you had such small quantities of runners, the locals were deeply involved. There was a lot of rapport, a lot of friendships made. 
runners would come out and stay at the same house year after year. It wasn't hard, you know. 200 runners, 250 was a big crowd. And that didn't happen again, I don't think, until after World War II. And after World War II, you had to hunt on the radio band to even find a report of the race. It was strictly low key. I remember WKOX, they would have it on every 15 minutes or so, but continuous running, all this has been all since the running craze. The whole thing has changed completely. One of the most obvious changes from the early days is that women now run the marathon. For more than half a century after this picture was taken, starting fields still remained exclusively male. Women took part in the marathon only vicariously, as spectators or water bearers. Long distance running was thought to be unhealthy for women, despite the fact the females had already proven their endurance in such long distance events as swimming. The change came in 1966 when Roberta Gibb ran unofficially. The next year, race organizer Jock Semple tried to pull the number off Catherine Switzer. He never did get it, and by 1972, women were officially recognized by the BAA. In the 1990s, thousands of women enter each year. Yep. Another big change is the wheelchair division. In 1984, the BAA officially recognized wheelchair racers. 14 years after, Eugene Roberts, a Vietnam vet, became the first person to complete the course in a wheelchair. After a several chair crash at the start in 1987, race officials set a speed limit of 15 miles per hour down the first big hill. The history of the Boston Marathon is a quilt of color and change. At the first start in Ashland, Tom Burke dragged his heel across a dirt road to form the starting line. In 1996, the heels of some runners will contain computer chips for precise timing. In the next 100 years, what new shapes, what new shades will the quilt take on? They propose running the race on Sunday. And there's a lot of hullabaloo because Patriots Day is a holiday only in Massachusetts and Maine. The rest of the country sees it on a work day or sees it after the fact. And with the big money involved nowadays, I expect to see more pressure to run that thing, at least on a national holiday or something. Now, it's one thing leads to the other. But there's a little low-key race, no more. You know, with science and instant replay and, and computer uh, robotics or whatever it is, you know, being able to figure things out with computer programs, I'm sure they'll find a much more efficient way to run if, again, if they're still running. Uh, the town, I don't imagine in 100 years the town's going to change a whole lot because if you look at the town now, it hasn't changed in the last 100. If you look at old photographs, uh, certainly the starting line wasn't there, but the town hasn't changed a whole lot in 100 years. So I think the times, the times will keep coming down. And uh, I also think the general population, um, you know, will continue to benefit from the knowledge from all the people that, that are out there training in events like the Boston Marathon. And, uh, and they, will, they will continue to explore their own fitness, I think, by trying events like Boston. You know, I think sports like that are going to continue to grow. No other marathon has the, uh, the tradition of excellence for 100 years. There's no other marathon like that. And, and just to have that to be run over the same course, pretty much the same course. So everybody, anyone, our sport, I always say it has no restrictions. If you want to run the marathon and race against the best in the world, Olympians from all over the world, you can do it. You can't go out and play against uh, the top athletes in the other sports, but you can challenge the marathon course and go over the same course and see what you can do you know, over these hills. And that's what makes it great, I think. <laughs> I love it.